study this evening is from Isaiah chapter 5. Starting verse 1, my well-beloved has a vineyard on a very fruitful hill. He dug it up and cleared it out of its stones and planted it with the choicest vine. He built a tower in its midst and also made a wine press in it. So he expected it to bring forth good grapes, but it brought forth wild grapes. Yeshua told a parable very similar to this of a vineyard and of a uh, owner who did everything he could to make it produce. Uh, we see everything there is good. It's a fruitful hill. It's a good location. The soil is good. He dug it. He cleaned it out of its stones. He planted the best, choicest vines that he could find, put a tower in there to watch for invaders and for uh, both human and animal, made a wine press, so ready for the grapes to come, invested time, energy, money into this. And instead of producing good grapes, it produced wild grapes. Let me tell you what I will do to my vineyard. I will take away its hedge, and it shall be burned, and break down its wall, and it shall be trampled down. I will lay it waste. It shall not be pruned or dug, but there shall come up briars and thorns. I will also command the clouds that they rain no rain on it. Every pronunciation of judgment upon the vineyard that did not produce the crop according to its ability. Very poignant message for us as well. God's expectation for us as well. God expects us to be able to do all that he has made us to do, which is different for every individual person. But he expects us to do all that we can do by his grace. United with the talents and unique abilities and location and, and position that he has placed us in. And if we don't meet that expectation, judgment follows. Woe to those who rise up early in the morning that they may follow intoxicating drink, who continue until night, till the wine inflames them. Like that picture? <laughs> it wasn't hard finding pictures for this. It was finding which one to show. <laughs> that was the challenge. <laughs> but all too often, right? And unfortunately, some of us have been there and have done that. But by God's grace, he has delivered us. Because there's a woe to those who rise up morning, in the morning and follow the intoxicating drink. Alcohol destroys, <laughs> destroys a of souls. The harp and the strings, the tambourine and the flute. In verse 12, and wine are in their feast, but they do not regard the work of the Lord nor consider the operation of his hands. So partying and music and alcohol, living life that God has given from the breath that he has breathed into us, from the strength and the energy that he has given to us, but not considering that we are God's handiwork, that God created us. And that we are fearfully and wonderfully made. And how miraculous and powerfully God made us. That we put toxins into our bodies continuously. And yet we live and resist it for so long as we do. is absolutely amazing. Eventually, the disease and the results catch up with us. But for how long it takes... If we did these kind of things to our cars, they wouldn't even run at all. Yeah, I mean, you put alcohol or sugar or whatever into your car, or tons of fat or whatever into your car. You know, grease into your car, it would, it would stop running immediately. But our bodies just keep on ticking for quite some time after the abuses that we do to it. 
and we don't consider it, we don't regard it as the work of the Lord, as the hand of the Lord, as the miracle of the Lord. My people have gone into captivity because they have no knowledge. Proverbs Solomon talked over and over again of the importance of the knowledge of and the knowledge of the word of God. Knowledge is one thing, wisdom is another. Knowledge, soaking up God's truth, soaking up God's word, understanding God's word, and then wisdom, putting it into practice in our lives. Starts with knowledge, getting to know God. He makes himself available to us. Again, just our bodies, just how they're made, just amazing things. Our hands are just amazing. I was thinking about that this week, how amazing. Well, Fred got me on that. He said, this is amazing. You want to see the most amazing tool? We were working, and he had a bunch of tools there. He said, you want to see the most amazing tool? And he raised his hand. <laughs> it is. It's an amazing tool. Absolutely remarkable. How we're made amazing. The abilities that God has given to us. And the eye. The eye is just an unbelievable mechanism. Thousands of muscles in play. So this little tiny eye. I can focus far, at least when we're young. I focus far and then <laughs> automatically focus close. I mean, just amazing. The ability to do that. All the various functions and nerve endings and that's, that's in there. And the picture comes in upside down and our brain flips it up the right side. Colors, be able to see colors. There's very few animals that can see colors. It's may amazing the complexity of the eye. There's all those various things taking place just to be able to see. There's no way it could just have happened. No way that all those different muscles and nerves and the ability both in the brain and in the eye itself and in the cornea and all the different aspects of it to all of a sudden just be there. You'd have to have one piece at a time evolve. And there's no way that according to survival of the fittest that these pieces would evolve without any purpose or use until they're all there in place. Absolutely. And we don't even have the best of eyes. I mean, like eagles and hawks, they can see much further than we and much sharper than we. Horses, they can see almost, you know, all the way around. And, and, and uh, flies, I mean, you look at the eyeballs on a fly or on a frog, right? You know, we're a higher species than that. How come we don't have eyes like that? <laughs> you know, I mean, we should have everything that's the best of everybody if we keep on evolving better. Right? So we can have eyes, you know, just see all over the place. Right? <coughs> Some people have eyes in the back of their head, but you know, not all of us have that, uh, that privilege. That's right, yeah. I didn't want to get specific, but you know. Yeah, we're made amazingly. So we can see the knowledge of God, the ability of God, the power of God, just in creation. And then in his word. When we go into captivity, we go into bondage, we go into bondage of sin and habits when we neglect God's word and ignore God's word and don't accept it and believe it for what it says. Verse 15, people shall be brought down. Each man shall be humble, like the guy on the chair, right? <laughs> or half off the chair, right? And the eyes of the lofty shall be humble. But the Lord of hosts, shall be exalted in judgment. And God who is holy shall be hallowed in righteousness. His righteous judgment will testify of his holiness, of his exalted position that he raises up and he can bring down, that he is still in control, that he is able to humble the proud, the proud, I have some friend take a picture of you, an embarrassing picture of you if you need to, to bring us down, to wake us up, to show us that we are weak without him, that we are in need of him. And again, eventually everything catches up with us, even if not eventually in all of our lives we get to the point of realizing our humanity, our mortality, and that it is only by God that we have life, and that we have strength. He will be exalted in the judgment. All will be seen that he has done right 
in his judgment. That he knows best. That he knows right from wrong. And he warned us and he told us for our own benefit. And one day, every knee shall bow and acknowledge that he is right. Now some will come forth as a message of just confession, but not of repentance, but others will acknowledge it in its verity and truth and acceptance of it and appreciation of it, that he is Lord of Lords, King of Kings, and worthy and right in his judgment. Even as Judas threw down the 30 pieces of silver, acknowledged that he betrayed innocent man. Not of confession, but just of acknowledgement. Not of repentance, but of acknowledgement. God will be exalted. One day every eye shall see. Verse 18, woe to those who tie themselves with cords of vanity. Woe to those that say, let him hurry and hasten his work, that we may see it. And let the counsel of the Holy One of Israel draw near and come, that we may know it. So in their pride and in their vanity, they're saying, hurry up. If you be God, come down and we will believe. If he is God, do another miracle for us. If you are the Holy One of Israel, Hurry and do some magical thing for us. Do some miraculous thing for us. God says, woe to us when we say that. As we said it in the wilderness, after God did miraculous things for us already and brought us out by an outstretched arm, we asked for more and for more and for more. In the day of Yeshua, they wanted more and more. He says, woe to those looking for signs and wonders. We go into captivity because we neglect the knowledge of God, the truth of God, the word of God. If we read the word of God and believe the word of God, we would see enough miracles in our lives that we wouldn't have to ask for miracles. We'd see them in everyday life. We'd see them in everyday things. We'd see them as we claim his word and apply it to our lives. As we see him changing our desires and changing our minds and changing our mindset, changing our lives, We'll see the miracle of God. We'll see victories in our lives. We'll see him give us the ability to do things we weren't able to do before. The ability to resist things we weren't able to resist before. We will see the miracles of God, the most powerful miracles of a changed life, of a changed heart. We won't need outward signs and outward miracles. Nothing for God to part a sea. It's nothing for God to provide food for thousands and millions. The biggest miracle is a changed heart. And as we intercede and pray for others and then act upon those prayers and demonstrate loving kindness to them and godliness to them and see their lives change, we'll see the miracles of God right before our eyes. But woe when we're doubting. Hurry up and show us Something. Do something. Even as we pray, Lord, come quickly, we need to also be praying, Lord, hold back so that we can share your love with more so that more can be in heaven. Verse 20, woe to those who call evil good and good evil, who put darkness for light and light for darkness, who put bitter for sweet and sweet for bitter. I've been hearing this quote often over the last several weeks. I've been quoting it myself over the last several weeks. And what we're seeing going on in the world around us more and more, everything seems upside down. People are calling things that are evil. The Bible declares it's evil and they're calling it good. And things that are wrong People are saying it's accepted and it's good. They're voting in the ballots and they're thinking majority should rule and make something that is bad now good. 
just because the majority thinks so? No, God will be exalted in that day. God's word is what is right, not majority rule with God. And even in a democracy, majority does not always rule. If the majority voted, no more speed limits on the highway or on any roads, no more stop signs, no more street lights, no more stop lights or traffic lights. Should we in, 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 install that and do that because the majority rules for it? The United States is a democracy, but it's also a republic, and a republic represents the weakest. Not just majority vote. And we have a responsibility, the government has a responsibility, and we as a people have a responsibility to our constitution to protect all. Not just majority rule. Not just because some groups are now saying this is good, which the Bible says is evil. Upside down. Upside down world we're seeing. Many aspects. In addition to another aspect, vilifying Israel in the world. Making them the Goliath and making the Palestinians the, Goli the, the David. The Palestinians, God helped them as well. God saved them as well. But Israel is the minority there. Israel is the one under attack there. Israel is the oppressed in this world today. And Israel is not the instigator. But the world is, media has turned everything upside down in all these other areas as well. The media is turning it all upside down as well. They're calling those who are just doing their job evil. Doing the job that the government has hired them to do and calling them evil when they're doing their job rightly and calling those who are doing evil as the victims. Upside down, crazy world, upside down world. Woe to those who call evil good and good evil, who put darkness for light and light for darkness. Woe upon this world, woe upon. We should look up and rejoice because our redemption draws nigh. Woe to those who are wise in their own eyes and prudent in their own sight. The wisdom of this world, the evolutionists of this world, wise in their own eyes. They don't have any proof of how it started. They don't have any hard facts. Wise in their own eyes, in their own estimation. Deniers of God, deniers of God's word. Wise in their own eyes. Proud, boastful, boastful. And woe to us as well. Any of these things should apply to us as well, could apply to us as well. Woe to us if we are ignoring the knowledge. Woe to us if we get pride, allow pride uh, to come into our minds and heart. Woe to us if we think our ways are better than God's ways. Woe to us if we try to reinterpret God's word. Woe to us if we take it and twist it to our own damnation. Woe to us if we think our religiosity covers our sin. Woe to men mighty at drinking wine. Woe to men valiant for mixing intoxicating drink who justify the wicked for a bribe and take away justice from a righteous man. Whoa. Woe is her, huh? <laughs> this is the third time in this chapter. There's three woes upon intoxicating drink. Specifically, and other places in the Bible as well. But right here in this one chapter, three times. Lots of other woes as well. 
but three times on this specific thing. And if the Bible was written today, it would have a whole lot of extra woes on intoxicating drugs, destroying the mind and destroying the soul and destroying the body. This one legalized, intoxicating drink legalized in this country, destroying lives. Those of us who have known alcoholics know the woe that takes place upon the family. Know the woe and the hardship and the sadness that's caused by the intoxicating drink. If anyone has been in an accident or knows someone who's been in an accident or has been killed by a drunk driver, knows the woe and the sadness and the heartache from those that partake in intoxicating drink. Destroys lives, destroys families, destroys careers, and often leads to other problems and other mistakes and other things that plague the person and all those around them. Again, in accidents, and you know, they lose their driver's license and then lose their job as a result, and then, then the whole snowball down the line. The productivity and society and the workforce moralizing character or stupid things they say when they're drunk or do that cannot be undone, that cannot be taken back, and the hurt and the pain that's caused, and how it's a gate to other drugs that destroy the brain. God has made us, and he created our brains amazingly. Can we destroy the brain cells? Destroy what God has placed there. Destroy what God has given to us and created for us so that he can communicate with us. How dare we deaden those senses. How dare we kill those very cells and neurons that give us the ability to know God and communicate with him. To talk to him, for, to hear from him. To hear his Holy Spirit convicting us. Woe to us. The wise in our own eyes. They found out how alcohol kills the brain. It kills the brain. Like what, what happens is uh, when you drink alcohol, it enters the bloodstream, it causes your red corpuscles to pump together like grapes. And your brain can't use that anymore. You can only, need, you can only extract oxygen. oxygen Single, uh, right, so it, it destroys the brain, destroys the brain cells, destroys the thinking, destroys especially uh, the, the deadens the frontal lobe where we do our thinking, where we do our decision making, where we make our choices. That's why people make stupid choices and that's why they make choices when, they're, when we're drunk than when, we, than when we would do when we're not drunk or stoned or, or drugged because of what it does to the frontal lobe where God wants to write his name. Where God wants to seal his character. The forehead. We destroy that. So that we cannot make right choices or that we don't make right choices. So the ability to make right choices is lessened. And that happens even with just one drink. Even just one glass of wine. And it said, woe to those who are wise in their own eyes. And how people would then use that and misuse it. And say that, that God is okay with that, that you should turn water to wine. Well, the wine in the Bible translated also can mean grape juice. I don't believe he turned it into alcoholic wine. I don't believe Yeshua would create something to kill. It would kill people's minds. Statistically, one out of ten, and that's a, that's a conservative, some studies say one out of five people who, who begin to drink, even just one drink, will end up continuing to drink and become alcoholic and, and, and destroy their lives and others. And if Yeshua had 12 disciples and at a wedding if there were 100 people there and he turned this water to wine, he would know that at least 10 people or at least one of his disciples would become alcoholic. He wouldn't do that. He wouldn't create that. I had someone come up to me at a gas station one time and uh, 
he asked me for some money, and uh, it was a restaurant, if you call it a restaurant, <laughs> one of these fast places, you know. Uh, so I offered, I said, I'll take you across the street and I'll get you something to eat. He said, well, honestly, I don't want something to eat. I want to go into the gas station and get a beer, get some beer. And I said, uh, no, I'll destroy your brain. Uh, why would you want something? God created you. He wants you to be whole. God can set you free from alcohol. And he said, well, you should. You, you, you should, you know, uh, turn, God turned water into wine. God drank wine, alcohol. So using that as an excuse. That's another reason why I don't think Yeshua did that. Because why would he allow someone, and many, to use that as an excuse for debauchery, for alcoholism, for destroying their lives and destroying their brain, destroying their souls. Again, there's many other reasons, but the Bible is pretty clear. Woe to those. There's a blessing in the grape juice. All the studies that say, oh, wine is good for your heart. It's not the alcohol. It's the grape. It's the, it's the enzymes in the grape. Drink lots of grape juice. And eat lots of grapes, and you'll have the same benefit. And even more, and even better. Without the deadening of the brain cell, God created us to be whole. Woe to those who destroy themselves with alcoholic wine. Solomon talks about this. And, uh, to, don't even look at it when it turns red in the cup, when it ferments. Therefore, as the fire devours the stubble and the flame consumes the chaff, so their root will be as rottenness and their blossom will ascend like dust because they have rejected the law of the Lord of hosts and despised the word of the Holy One of Israel. God will judge. As he mentioned at the beginning of the chapter, what he'll allow happen to his vineyard, he will allow it to be devoured, the flame consume it and consume every part of it, down to the root, nothing but rottenness, totally destroyed. Why? If we reject the law of the Lord of hosts. If we reject his word, if we reject his knowledge, if we reject, reject what he has said is right, reject what he has said is wrong, we will be destroyed. We will destroy ourselves. And he will be exalted in that day, in judgment. And it will prove and demonstrate that he is righteous. And because we despise the word of the Holy One of Israel, let us not be despisers of his word, but receivers of his word, and not just hearers of the word, but doers of the word. We cannot do it by our own strength and power. We cannot resist temptation and all these woes that we read in our own strength and power. We cannot resist pride. We cannot resist vanity. We cannot resist, resist drunkenness and debauchery and rejection and, and resistance to God's word in our own strength. Because we're born with those carnal inclinations. We're born with those natural desires. But thank God he has paid away, paved away. Thank God he has not given up on us. Thank God he reaches out to us. Thank God he sent the sacrifice for us. God himself has provided the sacrifice for us. To take away our sins and not only our record of sins, but to take our carnal nature and our carnal desires and our carnal hearts and our weaknesses and our inabilities and take them upon himself. Removing them from us taking our very selves into himself and destroying it once and for all. And he's promised then to give us a new life and to live in us a victorious life by his power and by his strength, by his mighty outstretched arm. Same one that parted the Red Sea, the same one that brought the plagues, the same one in his might and power has done gloriously, the same one who has come and lived a life without sin wants to come and live in his people and live out his life in us and through us. The power of God 
Verse 25, therefore the anger of the Lord is aroused against his people. He has stretched out his hand against them and stricken them. And the hills tremble. Their carcasses were as refuse in the midst of the streets. For all of this, his anger is not turned away. But his hand is stretched out still. God hasn't given up on us. God hasn't given up on this world. He has seen how we have rejected. He has seen how we have turned. He has seen how everyone has gone astray. Everyone has gone his own way. And yet his hand is outstretched still. He's allowed calamities to come upon this world. He's allowed calamities to come down upon us. He's allowed us to experience the, the, the depth of, of our decisions. And the end results of our mistakes. And we're bearing the consequences in wars and in problems and in death and in sickness and in heartache. And we haven't seen the full pulling away of God's spirit and full wrath poured out because God's hand is outstretched still. Five times in the book of Isaiah, he has this very phrase, for all of his, this, his anger is not turned away, but his hand is stretched out still. Five times. His hand is stretched out to us. God has reached down from heaven, and his hand is outstretched to us. He's reaching out to us. He loves us. Even in our sins, even in our mistakes, even in our stupidity, even in our rebellion, even in our addictions, even in our sins, even in our selfishness and boastfulness, self-centeredness, and pride and vanity. We must look pretty disgusting to the unfallen angels. We must look pretty disgusting to God who created us. But his hand is outstretched still. He hasn't given up on us. He's reaching out and drawing us with his everlasting love. He's drawing us with his spirit. He's drawing us to come unto him and to see him and to experience him. He says, come unto me, you heavy laden and I will give you rest. He's inviting us to come, to come to him. Come to us, come to him in our weaknesses. Come and surrender all. Come and lay it before his feet. Allow him to forgive. Allow him to cleanse. Allow him to remold us and remake us. Allow him to change us. His hand is outstretched still. we pray together. If any of these woes that we read tonight apply to your life, if you're doing any of those things or thinking any of those things or have that mindset of any of those woes, that's bringing conviction upon your heart and mind, giving you opportunity, his hand is stretched out to you to repent. He's giving you a chance to repent. He's giving you the gift of repentance. We can turn from our way Turn from our wrong examples. Turn for causing the downfall to others. And he can set us free. His hand is outstretched from heaven. Reach out and grab his hand. Let him lift us up out of the dust. Let us lift us up towards him. Be drawn to him in his power and his might. If you need lifting up right now, if you need strengthening right now, if you're needing hope right now, if you're needing courage right now, if you're needing power right now, victory over some negativity in your mind, victory over something in your lifestyle or life, grab a hold of his hand and let him lift you up, set you on solid ground. So we pray together. Our Lord and our God, King of the universe, 
For those of us here participating in the woes that we just read, we ask that you'll bring full conviction upon us and the gift of repentance. Give us a, a true godly sorrow for them and a confession of them and a turning from them. Lord, for those of us who've participated in the woes just read in the past, in our lives, and we're bearing the consequences of it, we're bearing the results of it, Lord, forgive us and wash us clean. Lord, for those of us who've made wrong choices in the past and was a wrong example to some others and set them on the wrong path, and we might have recovered, we might have repented, we might have turned from it, but maybe they haven't yet. Lord, forgive us for being that wrong influence, for being that wrong example. Or wash us clean, forgive us. And stretch out your hand to those that we've hurt and redeem them and save them. Or forgive us for being mixed up in our minds and calling good evil and evil good. Darkness, light and light darkness. Lord, forgive us for resisting your knowledge and resisting your word and resisting your law. Cleanse us and change us. Thank you for the Messiah's sacrifice. We accept that sacrifice in our behalf for the cleansing and for the removal, for the forgiveness and for the setting free. Lord, fill us with your Holy Spirit. Change us, transform us, empower us live out of us, and may people see you through us. In Yeshua's holy name, amen.